Your average smart home has been able to tell when you move into a room, but it's never been able to tell when you move into different parts of your room. Now, as I'm in my kitchen, I've entered into my cooking area and you can see that all my kitchen lighting has come on. Now, as I move towards my kitchen table, you'll notice that this comes on and my kitchen lighting has all turned off. So it knows that I'm here. And as I'm over here at the kitchen table, I've made sure to give myself a little extra special lighting when we're having dinner time. As I move into my couch area, you'll notice the ambience gets lifted up with this, so I'm ready to watch television. But again, my kitchen lighting has all changed. It's all off. So we're just getting in the mood for a little TV time. But as I move, over here, you'll notice right away there's a little bit of backlighting as I lay down on my big puff and I get ready to read my favorite book. Now all of this is possible because of one sensor on the top of my kitchen cabinets. It's called the Acara FP2 and I'm going to show you today what it's all about, how you can use it, and how you can properly configure it to get it working just like that. Hello automators, thanks for tuning in again. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and I'm all about saving time in your life with smart tech. So if you like that idea, hit the subscribe button right now. With something like the Acara FP2, you're gonna need to spend a little time configuring it and getting it set up properly in your home. You can see it back there. That's not even a perfect installation. I've done a few. I'm gonna share all of what I've learned with you today. Make sure you can get this right. When we compare something like the Acara FP2 to a standard PIR motion sensor, there's not much comparison. Now this is using what's called millimeter wave technology. It's at 60 gigahertz. And basically it's able to detect where objects and people are throughout your space. That's very different than something like this, which is essentially just looking for infrared changes in your space. So as you move, it's able to detect more or less your body heat. So what this can do is see if you've moved. And that means it's a on or off device. With something like that, we have more or less radar technology being employed in our homes. And that gives us a lot of analog control. That's the biggest difference here, as we're able to walk through different parts of our home, an up to 430 square foot room, and split it up into different areas and detect when we're in those different areas. The Acara FP2, it looks out at 120 degrees. And once you get out to a width of six meters, then you'll go out eight meters. That's a huge zone of detection for this sensor to look at. But just keep in mind how you orient the device. You can see it's kind of in the corner in my home. That will really affect how far into the corners of your room you can see because you've still got that angle. The other thing that is really beneficial with this sensor specifically is that it has a luminosity sensor on it. So you can run automations based on the lux or the light levels in your space as well as present. Here's the basic process for setting up the FP2. Later, I'm gonna show you how to do all of this, but this is the basic process for getting presence detection working. The first step is to mount the device where you think you're gonna place it. Remember that it should be two meters off the ground and that it should be in a room no larger than 430 square feet. The next step is to plug it in and begin the setup process in the Acara app. This is a Wi-Fi connected device, so it doesn't require an Acara hub like most of their other products. After basic setup, the device will try to identify interference sources it sees as well as the edges of your room. Then you will build your room and I would suggest that you build it with the stickers feature first. You'll walk around your room and make sure that the furniture and other objects are correctly oriented and correctly sized or at least as close as you can get it. 
that doesn't need to be perfect. Then add zones as you see fit. You saw that I had four zones in today's intro, but I'll explain how and why I've reduced that to three. Now that you have your map set up, you'll end up making adjustments because it won't be perfect the first time you do it. You can adjust the zones by long holding on any of the zones. That includes the exit and entrances, edges, interference zones, or any of the zones you've created. Then you can adjust where their edges are. You can remove blocks from them or add additional blocks to any of them, which can really help with those interference zones. And finally, you'll adjust the sensitivity settings, build automations, and connect the FP2 to other platforms like Amazon or Apple. Then what you'll find is the Akara FP2 can watch you move through your space. It will know when you've entered into the room and it will know when you've entered into a zone. It'll also know when you've left and it will know when up to five people are in the room at the same time. And it'll be able to run automations based off each of those zones that's a basic rundown of how the device will get set up and working in your home, but this is one of the most complex devices I've ever worked with. And a lot of the assumptions you have about how it will work and how you might employ it in your home could be very different from how it will be successful. So I've prepared a set of tips and tricks based on what I've learned with FP2. Now today's video is gonna show you how to do those things in the app and walking through a little bit of how that can affect things. The first thing I'm gonna tell you, I've moved this around a ton of times in my home. Uh, I've tried all kinds of different situations. It's gonna work really great in small spaces and there's a couple of considerations even to have within those small spaces that I'll get to. One of the first things that affects this device are what they call interference sources. Now an interference source is gonna make the sensor think that you're in the space or there's an extra person in the space with you when there's not. Or conversely, it's gonna think that you're not in the space when you are. Here's a list of the interference sources I know about today and that Akara has told me about. You're probably gonna have a few of these things in your home, and I do. There's three of them in my room with me today. Now the good news is I've mitigated all of my interference sources by changing the location of where I've installed this. I've pointed it away from most of them. And at this point, I only have one interference source, my air purifier, that could be a problem potentially for me. Now what you're gonna wanna do is one of two things. One, live with it and see if it affects you or two, identify it as an interference source. Obviously, there's a third option for you, which is to move the device. And I, I think that's actually an option a lot of you are gonna end up taking, because once you get it out of the way of the sensor, the sensor performs really well. Using the zones and that whole detection method, if you include something like an air purifier or your fan as an interference source, you personally will no longer be detected in that space. So it's important to note that these become like dead zones for the sensor. But it's not just those interference sources that'll determine how the device behaves and how it detects people. There's actually a lot of sensitivity settings in the app and some of them don't even say that they're a sensitivity setting. When you're building your map, you're creating a number of zones, and as you create those zones, you get to pick something called the zone type. Now that zone type is a factor or a multiplier for the overall sensitivity settings you've set in the Akara app. Now what I mean by that is in more settings, there are a few settings in here that determine the general sensitivity of the device. Distance of close induction, present monitoring sensitivity. Those are gonna affect the presence sensing in the entire room for the device. But what happens is that zone type becomes a multiplier. Uh, it can be a positive multiplier, as in it raises sensitivity, or it can be a lower multiplier and it lowers sensitivity. How do you determine which zone types are going to raise the sensitivity and which ones are not? That question basically comes down to an answer I got from Akara. 
If it's more likely that people are going to be in the space and if it's more likely that we need to know exactly where the person is, such as a situation like the bed. In general, you want to really know that someone is in that space, maybe multiple people, and you might, you might want to determine whether your spouse is still in bed before you run an automation to get out of bed and open up the curtains, right? So that's a situation where it's going to raise the sensitivity. But in general, you're just going to want to pick a zone type that is accurate to how the zone is being used. One of the things I found really helpful to do as I was building that map or rebuilding that map was actually just to kind of stand around my different objects or sit on my different objects. This taught me a lot about how things were being mapped in the space and then I adjusted where things were located. But it's important to note that the furniture, that doesn't actually affect anything in terms of sensitivity. It doesn't affect how the device works. It's just a placeholder for you to understand where someone is in the map. But as I did these zones, what I started to find was that boundaries and the number of zones could be problematic for me and they're gonna be problematic for a lot of people out there. Initially, when I set up the sensor and I put it on my kitchen cabinets, whether it was under or over, I had four zones set up. And one of those zones is exactly where the camera is sitting right now, which is the dining room table. But what I was finding is that that barrier between my zones and the app was just a little too close. And I was next to one of those interference sources with the curtains. The curtains were one problem because if someone sat on the edge of the table here and they were really close to the curtains, they would actually go in and out of the space because it would disappear in that interference zone. And there's always a little bit of movement in the person. Now that creates a whole host of things that you have to deal with in the map and with the sensor in general. My approach to this in this case has been to move the sensor and to stop trying to determine that someone is specifically in the dining room space. I just eliminated that fourth zone altogether and we've just accepted that the lights will be the same and the lighting conditions and the curtains and everything, that will be the same when we're in either the kitchen or the dining room. That's my solution to this. But the other thing that can help with this kind of a situation is to fine tune the zones. And what I mean by that is when I'm working with all of these blocks and I start to tap on that, I've added that to this zone. So that means anytime someone's detected in that space, they're part of this yellow zone here. It's called my big puff space right now. The first time I defined my zones, I was sitting on my couch and I was leaning forward looking at the application as we all do and I was within the zone so I had tapped on one of those and I said okay that's within my sofa zone and that was kind of the edge of where it was and then I leaned back and then I was out of the zone. So what that means from an automation standpoint is anytime you're creating an automation that's based on that zone now I'm out when I lean back and I'm in, I'm present when I lean forward. Obviously this is gonna be a problem. And you have three options. Move the sensor, move the couch, or move your zones. And I've found that in general, you're just gonna end up redefining those zones a few times and then you'll have it working generally right. And the other thing you're gonna to wanna to do is adjust how long you're in that space for that automation to run. That can really help. Now the problem there is when you look later in today's video, when I go through all the automation options you have, Akara's app gives you the option to use time delays in your automations. No other app does. And it's actually very different what you can automate in Google versus Amazon versus Apple HomeKit, how those automations run and what they even mean is very different. And here's the last gotcha that got me. Uh, now, I'm a decently sized guy. I'm, I'm not tiny, I'm not huge. A car sensor detects me pretty much every time I come into the space. Very easy, I put things on the lower settings, 
seem to be working great. And I let my kid play with the sensor for a little bit and I watched him move around the space. Very different experience. It almost didn't detect him with the low settings that I had initially set on the device. Now, I've been playing with them. I moved up to medium. I changed a few of the zone types, played with things quite a bit. I find that if I just set it up one level of sensitivity versus kind of what it says, the kid seems fine in this space. It doesn't seem to detect extra things, but again, that's gonna raise some of those issues with interference sources. You're gonna have to rethink about how to use the device then. So I hope these tips and tricks will help you understand how this device can be used, how it can't be used in your home. Let me show you the rest of how the device works so you can further apply this to your home. Here's what you get in the box with the FP2. The sensor itself comes out right away. You can see the little illumination sensor at the top of the device and then there's the stand with a little hole in it. Now the stand does come out, but you cannot rotate it around the device. It just moves up or down. And so this gives you a couple of orientations of the sensor, but it's mostly just straight up or straight down that you're going to be mounting it. Once you've become familiarized with how you think you will place the sensor, you can have a look on the inside. There is the USB-C power port that you're gonna be plugging into. On the bottom of the sensor, there is a button. This is really just for resetting and factory resetting the device so you don't really need it. But inside the box, we have a couple of magnetic plates. Either one of those can be used at any time and they will stick to the back of the sensor. Obviously, you're gonna align those holes exactly right if you're going to be using the screw that you're given as part of this. But there's also a 3M sticker that you wanna get exactly aligned with that magnetic plate. This will allow you to attach the magnetic plate to whatever surface you'd like and then have the sensor be still physically removable. Now, obviously you've gotta get that exactly lined up on all three and then you're more or less ready to go. You can have a read through the manual, but this whole video is there for just that. Now you do get the screw and the cable, which is quite long and it's USB-C from the device to USB-A. You'll need to get your own power adapter in this case, but it's time to plug in the device. And I would say that you wanna set this up near to where you are going to install it so you know whether or not the Wi-Fi signal is gonna work. Now we're using the Acara Home application and I'm adding a new device and I've selected to add the Presence Sensor FP2. You saw I just did a search there. I think that's an easy way to find this device. Now it's searching for accessories nearby and it's using the phone's Bluetooth to find the device. So make sure you have Bluetooth turned on on your phone and then enter in the credentials for your 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi network in your own home. Then you'll see the device gets connected very easily to your network, you're gonna name it, and then you go through the three different device cards. So I named the first one FP2, that's your presence, and I added it to the homepage board. I would recommend that you do it. Then I named my illumination sensor FP2 Lite, you can name it whatever you'd like, and again, I added it to the homepage. This is a fall detection. So that's what you're probably gonna want to name that by. If you're not mounting the device this way, then you don't need to put it on the homepage board. But this will get you set up. You'll have the device on the main page and it's ready for you to configure it properly. If you're just setting this up for the first time, this is what you're gonna see. Now I'm just going into the installation guide. You saw where I tapped on in the app to get here after I'd done the initial setup. Now you get three choices. This is really just for presence detection in a space. This gives you more control. It's meant for finding whether you're in a certain area in the room or not. And this is fall detection. So this is if you're gonna ceiling mount the device, point it down. That's the only way you can do that. 
I think in a lot of cases, people are doing personnel positioning. Now, the edge detection is being done automatically. So this is the device trying to automatically find all the edges. What you're supposed to be doing is kind of moving within the space to improve the accuracy of this. They say move randomly within the space to improve this configuration, uh, but I found that it helped. Now I added in all of these edges and the exits. The next step is configuring interference sources. Now this is the device just looking for those interference sources. What you'll find is that over here, you see interference, interference, it's marked those. And what it's actually marking there are curtains. It's detected it and most of the time you're just gonna hit the done button and you're done this whole configuration. But you can hit edit. So now we're back to the map and you're gonna have a blank map. In order to adjust what you have here, you can go into the management area. Now, your device is gonna be sitting up here just like mine is in, in I think every case, and you can go into the templates. So the first section is recommended ones, and you can tap on any of these. It would replace your map, so keep that in mind. You might wanna save your map before, I'll show you that in a second. And once you save that, it'll be in the my side. Now, in order to save a map, there's this icon at the top, and you're gonna tap on that, and then you're going to create a template. One of the great things that they did is they give you this option to take a photo or choose from your photo album and attach that as part of the template. So now I called that Final Kitchen. And here you go, I've got two final kitchens now. So you can see at one point I added in stickers, which is our next aspect. Now the stickers don't actually affect how your map is going to behave or how your device behaves at all. The important thing for you is just the orientation, it's not gonna be perfect. The location, the size, it's not gonna be perfect. For every device that you add, down here, there's a number of different stickers. Uh, what you can do, so I just added a floor lamp. Let's say that my floor lamp was here. I can make it larger, I can make it smaller, and I can rotate it. Now obviously that doesn't matter much with a floor lamp like this. If I no longer want the device, I can get rid of it too. There's an X right there, it's gone. Now I don't have it. And you can see that I had to reorient things. Again, it's not perfect because when you rotate these, you're just rotating them, uh, it's about 45 degrees, right? So you might have a bit of a different angle depending on how you mount this sensor. That's okay, it doesn't affect how the device behaves. You're just going to use basically a movement around objects like this to determine where to place that sticker. And you just wanna get it about right, and then that will help you with the next part of the process. Now the next part of the process is the new monitoring areas. You can just hit this new monitoring area and now you're creating a new one. So if I wanted a fifth area, let's say I wanted it to be this little area right here, I could tap around and then I can modify the name. I can call it, oh, <laughs> monitoring area 51. That's not a problem at all. Now, if I don't like where the uh, map is or where these are situated, I can tap on them to get rid of them. Anytime you uh, tap on the screen at all, you can drag quite far. Once you've created monitoring areas you're gonna hold, long hold on any of them. This brings you into the area. You can delete it, or you can make adjustments on color or the type, and you can make adjustments for where it is situated in your home, and then you can save it. The other type of zones that you will deal with are the new other areas. And you can see I just long held on the exits and entrances. This is one of the three types. You can adjust the colors and you can delete the area if you don't like it and you can modify it just like all the other areas. 
exits and entrances help with automations. Now, the other kind of area is called the edge, and you can put this in. I've done that manually after the automatic configuration. And you can change the color just the same as all the other zones, and you can adjust where it is on the map. There's a third type of other area called an interference source. And again, you can long hold on any of those areas inside of the map, and then you can make adjustments. If you had multiple interference sources, you can add that in a different part of the map if you'd like. So all the interference sources, those zones, they don't have to touch. But once you've created all three of those other areas, it'll tell you you're up to the maximum number and you're done. You can see all the different statuses, all the different detections. The illuminance right here, this is another thing. You can look at the graph, you can look at how it's changing in your home, and then that helps you set thresholds for things like automations. So I think that's very useful, and you can uh, pinch and zoom out. Now, as you're using the device the first time, you might find that things aren't working quite right. And this is where you wanna head into settings, and I'll give you some other tips here. These settings, present monitoring sensitivity, this is one of the more useful ones if you're running into a lot of ghosts throughout your map. You just see an extra person on the map or you've left the map and you're seeing a person on the map staying there for longer than 30 seconds. Now, when you have a large complex area, a lot like my map, you wanna select low. Smaller areas, high and medium are gonna work better for those. You can see that high specifically is intended for bedrooms. That's to help you tell if someone is in bed. Distance of close induction. That's a confusing term for what is essentially one meter, two meter or three meter uh, distances for detecting people in the space. And if you wanna be finer, detailed if you want to get closer to the device before it detects you select that i think medium is going to work in most cases for people this is a pretty useful setting right here it says reset the unmanned status so whenever you're finding that there's a ghost in the map come here hit the reset button get rid of them the reason that helps is both Yep, it'll clear them out of this space, but it teaches the device over time that will help this device get more and more accurate at knowing when you've left the space. All right, you've got it configured, you're feeling good, and this is where a bit of the iterative process is gonna show up on you. Now, automating with the Akara FP2 is very different depending on how you plan to use it. I'm gonna give you a great example. Now back there is the Govi, it's a corner lamp. That's how I use it, I even call it corner lamp. It has great effects. But, you know, this only connects through Amazon's voice assistant or Google's voice assistant. Now unfortunately, the FP2 with Google Home today it's not a great situation. What I mean by that is, yes, the sensor comes in. Yes, you can see all the different areas that you have set up inside of the Akara application, but in the app itself, you never see the status. It's not showing up there. It's, there's no difference. I can't see the status. Even if I tap into it, all I'm getting is this little page where I can change some of the details. Now the one thing that you do get with Google Home that's really interesting is the voice notifications. Now that means that when you enter into that area, a Google Assistant speaker will tell you that you're approaching it. It's just like a doorbell. But I cannot automate, so I can't turn on that lamp with Google Home if I enter into this area or into any of the areas. On the flip side, Amazon can automate with these. Now here's an automation that I've created. It is basically, there's no motion detected in the cooking area for 20 minutes. Now this is very different than Apple HomeKit. Apple HomeKit is where I think a lot of people will use this kind of a device. 
but it can be really touchy. The unfortunate part here with Apple HomeKit is that there's no time delay. So you can't say, okay, if someone hasn't been in the space for let's say 10 seconds, then turn out the lights or then make an adjustment. And you know, I've got the Acara uh, curtain driver sitting there and I actually have the SwitchBot one sitting here. I was doing some matter bridge testing. So I'm gonna describe what happens by showing you on the map. Now I'm not physically moving around, but you'll notice the little guy that is me in the Acara app is moving a little bit. So if one of your areas is somewhere you sit, you're just on the edge of that area, then what will often happen is with Apple HomeKit, those automations of presence detected in a certain zone or no presence detected in a certain zone, will flicker things like lights. Or when you're working with something like this, it will actually move them incredibly quickly. Now, I had these running for about 10 minutes at one point where they would just move back and forth based on those automations. And I'd only been sitting here a couple of minutes, but I had that little figure on the map moving in and out of a zone. And then I had those automations that were based on the zone detection, either presence in the area or not presence in the area. So that's something to watch out with, uh, with Apple HomeKit here. What's really nice about the Acara FP2 with Apple HomeKit is that when you bring it in to their application, you get all those zones just like you did in Google and Amazon, but you also get the illumination sensor. That's the first time it's shown up for me outside of the Acara application. The other nice thing is you get the whole presence sensor as a whole. Now that also shows up in Amazon and you can use that status if there's someone in any of the zones to run automations off of. Now with Google, Amazon and Apple, all of those apps, obviously you're not creating automations with two conditions or not really with two conditions. You can put in the timeframes and the days in both Amazon and Apple and you can put in whether people are home with Apple HomeKit. Okay, that's great, but this doesn't allow you to really get in depth with your automations. That's where you're going to need the Acara application. Keep in mind, in that app, you won't necessarily have all of those devices, but it's an extremely powerful automation tool. Let me show you how that works. But I've gone into the automation tab here. I'm gonna hit the plus and I'm just gonna show you the options that you get with the FP2. Anytime I go into any of these zone options on the trigger side of the automation, I'm going to be able to pick from all of those different zones that I've created myself in the map. So I can go into one of those and then I can pick any of these different conditions. So I actually get three different options in some cases. Now I find the presence, the absence, and in some cases the enter or leave to be very useful. So these will detect when you're entering or leaving the area. This is detecting when your presence is in the area and this is absence, so you've left. I find that someone is approaching and going away to be less useful. I, I don't find they work in these small spaces uh, and it, it might work overall, but even that I've struggled a bit with. So I find just presence works fairly well and absence. Now the other two are presence for some time, so that's a nice option for you. You've been in the area for a little bit, Maybe you wanna set things. You can see that the minimum is five seconds. Maybe you just wanna have things happen at 10 seconds. That's been added. You can also uh, set an acting time, which means what time of day, which days you would like it to even run. So you have those options too per condition in Akara's app. Then you can kinda of swipe that way and hit the delete button. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, and it also can be used as a trigger. So once you've left an area for a certain amount of time, there you go. Now, 
if you want to get outside of the zones, you can start to use these ones down here on the, the bottom. Presence detection. That's for the entire sensor, so that'd be anywhere on the map. Which is the same for absence, leaving, entering, leaving on different sides. Someone is approaching, someone's going away, someone falls down. So this is your fall detection, fall down and exceed a certain time. So, you know, if someone just gets down on the floor, you don't necessarily want a big alarm going off. Maybe you want to wait a minute or two. There is, of course, the illuminance sensor. So you can include those. Here they are, reaches up to, drops to, or an assigned so it's above a certain level these kind of work the same for the most part uh, this is reaches up to and then this is above again there is a presence for some time and an absence for some time so that's the whole device maybe you only want things to happen after some time if you look on the then side of the device you can reset the absence status so if you know that you're gonna leave the room and when you open a door, you know you're out of the room, you can reset that absence status. That is the setting that we used earlier. So those are the automation options inside of Akara's application. As always, automators, if you need a little bit of help with the Akara FP2 or you're still making a decision, maybe you're looking at another presence sensor or two that are available on the market today, ask me those questions down below. Happy to help you guys out. I answer every question I can. The links are all below for the Akara FP2. Go pick up one. I'm loving having this in my home. It's especially gonna work great for those of you with Apple HomeKit. Otherwise, what you're gonna to wanna to see is the video that's up on screen. That will show you the new EP1 presence sensor from Lewis over at Everything Smart Home. It's a great comparison to make next to this one. Otherwise, thanks for watching today, and of course, don't hate, automate.